Hello and welcome to the France 24 debate. I'm Marco. In scenes of open revolt in Brazil, protesters invading the presidential palace, the Supreme Court and the capital of Brasilia, also the Congress, an angry mob of supporters of defeated presidential candidate Jair Bolsonaro. The far-right mob causing huge damage to the headquarters of the three powers in Brasilia, the Palacio de do Planalto, which is the presidential palace, the Congress and the federal Supreme Court. Brazil's Ministry of Justice says there are some 300 people under arrest. Independent estimates say that figure is far higher. President Lula da Silva was visiting flooded areas near Sao Paulo at the time. He wasted no time in calling the mob fascists and promising those responsible would be punished. Bolsonaro, the outgoing president, lost to left-wing candidate Lula da Silva back in October. The margin of victory was slim. 50.9% to 49.1%. Bolsonaro immediately called fraud. He refused to concede. And the lack of respect of the democratic process has festered into a rotten wound at the heart of Brazilian society, resulting in what happened this weekend. It perhaps mirrors a similar rejection of democracy in other places, notably the United States. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Let's introduce our panel uh, to discuss the situation. Uh, here on set we have with us uh, Maria Paula Cavalho, who's a journalist with the Brazilian service at Radio France International. Thank you very much for being with us. Pleasure to see you. On the other side of our studio, Ligia Mauro Costa, who is a professor at the FGV, which is the Guilherme Vargas Foundation, a business school. Thank you for joining us. On the other side of the studio, Philippe Galvo, who is a filmmaker, Thank you, sir, for being with us, too. And we have, waiting for us uh, in Brazil, our correspondent, Tim Vickery. Tim, we'll get to you in a moment. First, let's take a look at our report uh, of the events as they unfolded. Escorted by the police and security forces, rioters board buses in their hundreds, heading for detention. One cries foul of what she sees as an injustice. There are no criminals here. We were just protesting. We want to save the country. During the uprising that lasted several hours, supporters of former President Jair Bolsonaro ransacked Brazil's Congress, Presidential Palace and Supreme Court in scenes eerily reminiscent of the US Capitol riot two years ago. This in protest at Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva being sworn in as president a week ago, claiming his election victory in October over Bolsonaro was a fraud. Lula declared a federal security intervention in the capital until the end of the month, slamming the protesters as fascists and blaming his far-right predecessor for inflaming his supporters from abroad. It's a genocide. This was provoked and stimulated, and which is still being stimulated through social networks from Miami, where he went. Bolsonaro left for the United States just two days before his mandate was to end, a move widely seen as an attempt to evade Brazilian justice. He took to Twitter rejecting Lula's accusations and saying the invasion crossed the line. Peaceful demonstrations in the form of the law, are part of democracy. However, depredations and invasions of public buildings as occurred today, as well as those practiced by the left in 2013 and 2017, escaped the rule. Brazil's Supreme Court removed the governor of Brasilia, a Bolsonaro ally, from office for 90 days over security flaws. Ibanez Russia had already come under criticism for putting the former justice minister, a Bolsonaro loyalist, in charge of public security in the federal district. Images shared on social media also showed military police appearing to guide the rioters towards the government buildings and initially not putting up any resistance to the invasion. You can roll over that report. Just to uh, point out the obvious, we've got three guests here who are Brazilian. We have a correspondent who's practically Brazilian uh, in his outlook, uh, Tim Vickery, who we're coming to in a moment. Let's start here in the studio with uh, Maria Paula Cavalho, journalist in the Brazilian service at Radio France International. Um, what are your feelings right now about what's happened? Well, I can tell you that I'm not surprised, because if you see the images uh, we saw yesterday in Brasilia, they are quite similar to the ones of the 6th January in uh, Washington, when the supporters of uh, Donald Trump invaded the Capitol building. Donald Trump, which is an ally of Bolsonaro, Bolsonaro is in the US now, so it seems that this is part of uh, probably an international right-wing movement. 
But despite the fact that the movement was quite spread in social media, uh, the demonstrators found no resistance in Brasilia yesterday. So the police, the the uh, the police in mm. Brasilia didn't do anything to stop them, and. So it was surprising for me as a Brazilian to see all those people entering this beautiful modernist uh, buildings signed by uh, our architect uh, Oscar Niemeyer. Why did the police just look on? But if you talk to Bolsonaro's uh, supporters, they will say that they are trying they are uh, tired of being dis disrespected. They are tired of being robbed. They will call Lula a robber, a thief. You know, I told you here when we came to talk about the elections that before, if yes. Lula is the most loved man in Brazil, he is also the hated, hatest man in Brazil at this moment. And so I think people don't forget that he was involved in the car wash investigation and this uh, supposed uh, involvement of him with corruption. And some people really believe they are participating in a revolution in Brazil. And then they really have to uh, save the country from this rotten and corrupted system. So they continue saying they are not violent. They are saying they were protecting uh, public possesses. So you can see videos from in the internet. They are protecting the, the, the art that we can see in the palace. So they will say there were people infil infiltrated, the people from Workers' Party that were participated on that. But now things have changed. I think this is going to strengthen even more Lula because he has received uh, support from the other powers and even international leaders now. Okay, Paula, thank you for now very much. Let's cross the studio. Uh, Legia Mauro Costa uh, from the uh, Getulio Vargas Foundation. Um, from the business aspect, of course, this has made Brazil's stock plunge. People will question uh, the stability of the country. It might affect what goes forward. But can I just ask you for a, a sort of a primary gut reaction about mm -hmm. when you see those images, what do you feel? I feel that I would love to see my country all over the news in the world, but not in this situation. From an economic perspective, Brazil is facing a really a huge challenge. And, um, and now we cannot focus on economy aspects because we have to focus on governability, on a sustainable government after what, what has happened yesterday. So I think this is not nice for the country. On the, on the other hand, what it is good it is that the stock exchange market has just, you know, remained stable today. So, so this, so is, the, this uh, is really, you know, something that we have to think about. It. Maybe I've read there's been are, a fall. There's been no real fall in no, stock? No, no, not okay. today. Interesting. Not today. This is very interesting mm. because, you know, everybody thought that the dollar would go up and et cetera. However, the stock exchange has just, you know, remained waiting, like, like you know, waiting to see what is going to happen. And uh, so this is at least it, it is good. But the bad part it is that instead of focus on economy, on the economic aspects, because Brazil is really in need of, of that, the government now has to focus on governability issues and see how we are going to handle this situation. Because, you know, there was an intervention. You know, the governor from the, the, the federal district of Brasilia has been put in a way from my perspective, in the right way, what has been done by the Supreme Court. Because, you know, they, as Maria Paula has just said, police officers, they just watched. They almost, you know, <laughs> there was a movie where they were drinking coconut water with the Manifestant while they were invading, you know, the monuments in Brazilia. So this is really... Can I just repeat that? So, so the, the police drinking coconut water with the demonstrators yes. as they were actually marauding and taking yes. over the, 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 the seat of the presidency. While they breaking everything. So it doesn't make any sense. Sorry. Well, it, so it, um, this I'm, is really a, a little bit too much. It's really saying something, <laughs> yes. isn't it? But it's yes. interesting about the, 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 the economic aspect of that. But one wonders, like you say, if the government is now going to look at sort of rule of law rather than helping ordinary people, and there are lots of ordinary people who need help from the mm -hmm. government, then obviously that's shortchanging those, those people, sadly. Thank you, Ligia Mora, for that. We'll be back to you in a second. Felipe Galvo, filmmaker. If this was a film, people would say it was just too much of a fantasy, they wouldn't believe it, would they? It's an horror, horror movie. Horror movie, yeah. And, uh, but it's a horror movie that, uh, uh, that took place a long time ago, and we are seeing the climax. 
And uh, yesterday there, w there were four hours of chaos. And the message for me is clear. There will be four years of chaos. And um, there will be no peace. So that's during the, the mandate of Lula, there will be yeah. continued provocation. That, that's it. For me, it's, uh, it's a movement that is, is very profound, is very, uh, how do I say, mo molecular. There, wa there were not uh, a leader, uh, leaders, very clear leaders of this movement. And uh, it, uh, the tendency is, is to uh, that it will, the episodes like, uh, like that, uh, will be uh, frequent. And I think that we saw the first act yesterday, the first act of something that will be not uh, something uh, equal in Brasilia, because Brasilia is made for, for, not, uh, uh, for not allowing people to uh, affront the, 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 the power. So uh, it was made like that. The, it's architected for this. Oh, so it's, it's actually designed, designed architecturally to stop yeah, this kind of confrontation. To, to stop very, very rapidly uh, um, uh, some protests, some, some. Uh, so hang on, let, let me. So, so Nehemiah, the architect, designed yeah. this place in order to help the police stop what, was, what might happen. And even which reinforces yeah. what Maria Paula was mm -hmm. saying about you know, what were the police actually doing? Yeah, and uh, you, there were orders that would were not being obeyed. You know, uh, for example, that's why the governor of uh, the federal district was uh, ejected because uh, they, uh, it uh, happens that he he was supposed to uh, to make uh, the policeman go at at one time and he didn't did anything and even worse, the policeman don't didn't show up. They received the orders and didn't didn't show up. I have uh, some uh, some people in Brazil that uh, work uh, in the in the justice, and they say they said to me that uh, there were clear orders to 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 policemen to go, and they voluntarily didn't go. So it it shows a, a bigger problem than than we thought. Indeed, a police officer is a human being. A human being obviously will have a exactly. political leaning or, or a sense of what goes on. Or, but obviously one would expect with the police there's this idea of duty, which is over and yeah. above what they should feel as people and they should apply the rule of law to the situation. Yeah. We're kind of saying that didn't happen. Yeah, and I think that because Bolsonaro and Bolsonarism, uh, it touched uh, some identitarian, some uh, ideological level in these people, you know, conservative values and uh, security levels, uh, security values. OK, um, politics can often be a very, bit of an illusion. Very, very. Can I just pause you? I need to bring in Tim from Rio. Tim, who's been observing the matters for us. Tim Vickery, good evening to you, sir. Um, there are many questions. Uh, can you provide us with some answers? What, what's your sense, Tim, of, of what went on? Uh, you've, you've heard the questions raised by people here in the studio. Uh, give us your assessment. Well, let's compare this with January the 6th in the, in the States two years ago, because I think it's an interesting comparison. Um, on the one hand, the timing of this is different. It comes after Lula has been sworn in as the country's president. Now, that places all those people involved in yesterday's action in a very delicate legal position. Perhaps that's one reason that although fleets of buses were laid on for supporters free of charge, everything paid while, while you're in Brasilia, the mobilisation was nothing like we've seen in the past for big pro-Bolsonaro rallies. Now, what Bolsonaro doesn't have in comparison with Donald Trump is a huge political party behind him to pump out the big lie pump out the idea that the election was uh, was a question of fraud. Uh, and what we're seeing here is the far right looking increasingly isolated in Brazilian society. On the other hand, what Bolsonaro does have is significant support inside security forces, inside police, inside the armed forces. What happened yesterday cannot happen without, uh, without an ineffe inefficient police presence and a police presence determined to be 
inefficient. The positive thing from Lula's point of view is that the institutions have hit back. We had a possible flashpoint today because uh, the, the far right, they've been camped outside military barracks now for more than two months calling on the military to take over. And it, it was from there on Sunday that they walked down to take control of these buildings. That Bolsonaro camp, that should have been dismantled a long time ago. The military seemed reluctant to do that. Overnight, we had hard and fast orders from the Supreme Court for that camp to be dismantled. You wondered, would the security services carry out that mandate? They've carried it out. The camp has been dismantled. So Lula's institutional position seems to have been strengthened by the action. There hasn't been a mutiny from the army in terms of uh, dismantling the camp today. So at the moment, the far right, it certainly is a presence. And that could be a presence that exists independent of Bolsonaro. If Bolsonaro doesn't want to move, doesn't want to leave this movement, this movement still exists. What do they want? Well, they want Lula to be deposed. They want the military to take over. Fundamentally, I don't think this has a great deal to do with accusations of Lula's corruption. Fundamentally, these people really believe, they genuinely believe that there is a communist threat to Brazil. It's bizarre because for anyone like myself who grew up in Europe pre-Mrs. Thatcher, the first Lula government, you couldn't remotely describe it as a left-wing government. It was very much a government of the centre. And that's even more the case with this new administration. It's a broad front administration. But we are dealing with a phalanx of the far right who seriously believe that they are trying to save Brazil from a communist threat. Uh, and uh, that's one reason why a leading social scientist over here says Brazil is a laboratory for an alternative reality. New media have created a new reality for a phalanx of people who it's going to be very difficult to assimilate them, to re-assimilate them into democratic society. Tim Vickery, fascinating. Thank you very much indeed. Your explanation is, is, is thorough, but it raises even more questions. Uh, we'll get to that in a moment. Let's take a look, as we've already alluded to, about the parallels between what has happened in Brasilia and what happened in the United States on January the 6th. 2021. Fervent mobs who believe they're doing good for their country by attacking its highest institutions. The police being incredibly ill-prepared, even raising suspicions of possible complicity. For many, scenes playing out in Brasilia were like a deja vu, happening two years after the January 6 Capitol riot in Washington. Both were triggered by far-right presidential candidates refusing to recognize the outcome of an election. This is not about the continuity of the electoral process. This is terrorism. It's a coup. When he was president, Jair Bolsonaro earned the nickname Trump of the Tropics for his nationalist agenda and leadership style. Both were outsiders who challenged the political establishment. Bolsonaro's rejection of his election defeat as a fraud seems to come straight out of Trump's playbook. And just like the former US president, the Brazilian used social media to spread lies and incite outrage among his loyalists. However, there are also notable differences. Trump was still in power when he encouraged his supporters to head to the capital to stop Congress from certifying the election result. The riot in Brasilia came one week after Lula was inaugurated, with Bolsonaro having already left the country. There is no kind of a Brazilian embrace of the big lie like you had in the United States. Uh, and I think that's a very fundamentally different starting point, and that's an advantage for Lula. However, Lula does not enjoy majority support in parliament, unlike Joe Biden did when he took office, and will have to work with a Congress that is largely in the hands of his political opponents. Roy, with that report, just to remind people, back in October, of course, it was uh, Lula, who was uh, the, the leftist, uh, controversial in many ways, uh, loved by many, hated by others, who, who was elected by the narrowest of margins. His primary policy, I suppose, to bring more fairness to society, save the Amazon rainforest. Bolsonaro, 
very much to the far right, someone who had actually sort of really encouraged the development of the Amazon rainforest, that, in other words, is saying the destruction of it in many ways, and that alarming the whole world that that should happen. And he, of course, refused to recognize the result. And uh, just before he was uh, out of power, of course, he went to the US, where he still is. And he's currently, we understand, in hospital with abdominal pains. So we're told by his family uh, that it's not life-threatening. Let's get back to our panel. Uh, Maria Paula Cavalho of RFI's Brazil service. Can I bring you back in? This idea, as Tim was talking about, as we heard in the report, that there's this whole sort of uh, conspiracy theory happening across Brazil. I mean, that's an alarming thing. Felipe told us the, the first round was um, last Sunday. I would say it was the 30th um, October during the elections. Because for those people that were in Brasilia yesterday, they think Lula should not have run for presidency. This is something you don't talk a lot here in Europe, that Lula, okay, he was acquitted of the accusations, but only because the Supreme Federal Court has decided that Curitiba in the southern part of Brazil was not the right jurisdiction to take care of his uh, investigation. So technicality. Because he has been condemned in many levels of the Brazilian uh, judicial system. So those people really believe uh, that Lula was no, is not his president. And also you have to talk about the Brazilian system. We have these electronic ballots since uh, 1996, and they have been working quite well. They are not uh, uh, real computers because they are not connected to internet, but they can identify the voters and you can cast your vote on them, then they will submit the results. But you don't have a physical proof of what has happened. So this has created all this, uh, um, how can I say? Doubt? Fake this news. Doubt. Fake. Fake, fake, fake news. And, yes. and fake the, news. The, fake the, news, yeah. the former president was really incentivating this kind of things in Brazil. And we have to say also that the army didn't do anything to take these people from uh, the... Um, the the, camps. The, the the camps and the military buildings in Brazil. So we still think, is the army going uh, to take part of this or no? Until yesterday, we didn't know what was, was going there? to happen. Tim's told us that the camp, the big Bolsonaro camps, yeah, been expanded. now because so the, the judiciary. Uh, do you feel do you feel any 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 kind of security in the fact that has happened? Do you? I think they they shouldn't be there like for months and. You know, they say, we are families, look, there are children here, we are not going to be violent. But at the same time, they don't accept the law, they don't accept the result of the elections without any proof. I'm a journalist, I would be the first one to check if there was a, a, a proof that something was wrong. So I'm still waiting to see the proofs that the, the electric, uh, electronic ballots don't work. The problem that you face and I face, Maria Paola, in what we do for a living is that people out there will turn around and say, you're just part of the media conspiracy, that of kind of course, thing. Which is especially in Brazil now. They don't believe in journalists anymore. This is yeah, okay. a fact. Here we're trying to get to the truth of the matter. Uh, Legia Mara, can I bring you back in from the uh, Gatulio Vargas Foundation? Uh, business is what you deal with, but obviously you're Brazilian and you've got a whole view of and this, I'm a this entire thing. And a lawyer too. So there we go. We've got all <laughs> bases covered with this woman, which is fantastic. Uh, in terms of the, the whole legality of what's been done, I mean, clearly, you know, there's a whole raft of laws that have been broken and we, we could go through all those and probably sort of take up all the time for discussion. In, in terms of what happens next, Lula says people will be prosecuted. I mean, basically, there, there sounds like there'll be a lot of people to be, to be gotten hold of. 300 in custody, we believe, maybe more. Maybe more, maybe more. I read that it's 1,200 that have been, you know, in custody. We'll get Tim to confirm I'm not, in a Yes, moment, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. And, um, and now they are going to face process, you know, a fair process. Mm. And they have to be put in jail. They have to be prosecuted. This should never, ever have happened in Brazil. Plus, we have also to look after police officers, even the army, even the Brazilian intelligence, because actually now that you start reading things, there were a lot of WhatsApp groups actually talking about that. Buses have been, you know, offered to people, you know, to go to Brasilia, offering food, etc., etc. So we have to go after the money to see who is financing this, because this is terrorism. You're not talking about, you know, communist, oh, I am against communist. No, no. Now we are talking about terrorism. And the, the, the judicial force, they have to, you know, to do something. They have to prosecute people. They have to investigate. And that we cannot admit in a young democracy like Brazil that this thing can happen ever, ever. 
You know, if you, this is not democracy. If you don't like the president, sorry, you lost. Move over. In four years, you're going to change and try to change. But not, you know, do what you're doing. Just, you know, forcing your candidate or asking for a military intervention. Military intervention is a dictatorship regime. I don't know if they understood that. Maybe the idea is that they don't understand that this is dicta dictatorship. So this is not what Brazilians want. The majority of Brazilians won't. Of course, Brazil lived under a period of dictatorship exactly. until the mid-80s. And I think that that's the reason why Brazil took a while in order to take off the camps. Because of the dictatorship regime, people didn't want to, you know, if we <laughs> move forward, maybe people will feel that, you know, this is uh, too, too strange and maybe we'll become the movement a little bit stronger. Maybe, maybe that's the reason why the army said, no, we are not going to move. They are going, you know, to spread um, a little while. But now, after that, I think that the Supreme Court did, you know, the right path. Now you have to stop, stop. It's over. OK, thank you very much indeed, uh, Ligia Mara, for that analysis. Let's go back to uh, Felipe Galvo, our filmmaker. Um, Felipe, I hate to sort of come up with another sort of film line to you, but <laughs> it, I'm going to do it. Um, it, it. You could almost make, from your perspective, a kind of a no. parallel, parallel reality piece between Bolsonaro and Trump and what happened. I mean, th it's alarming that there is such parallels, isn't it? Yeah, but I, at, uh, at the same time, no. Uh, I just came from Brazil. I was filming a new film there, and I was, I happened to, to, to be there in a Bolsonaro, pro-Bolsonaro camp, one of these. One of these actual camps, yeah. okay. I, I, I ran off because uh, some, at some point I, I, I had, to, I had to, to run off because there was a lot of hostility because I have a camera. So they, they Purely paint simply because you had a camera. Yeah, yeah. We uh, asking more good questions. Oh yeah, yeah. Are People with more arms. Good questions? Yeah, a lot of questions. Okay. Hey, what is your name? What is your name? What is your Instagram? So I gave a, a fake name, and uh, I was with, uh, with an assistant, and uh, they we managed to to be there for like uh, 15 minutes, 20 minutes at, at most, and then uh, whoop, we run off, and. Uh, as uh, Ting Vickery uh, said, it's really a laboratory for an alternative reality, a laboratory for a dystopic world. Mm -hmm. Brazil, uh, I, I'm, I happen to, to film, film this. I'm, I'm doing a film about this parallel between what happens in Brazil it what happened and what happened in France since the Yellow Vests uh, movement. And for about four years that I, that I wrote that and that began, began this movie, uh, oh, I always heard that it's nothing to do with. It is, there are two different, different realities. You can do this parallel. And now, since yesterday, I'm hearing in all the, the TV shows and, the, and, and the, the journal that this parallel can be done because the, it's the same uh, form of, of organization, non-organization. As a matter of fact, I think that uh, what happened in 2013 in Brazil is more likely what happened with the Gilets jaunes. But 2013, that was the biggest movements uh, against power, against the system, this, the, the words were that, it evolved in the, in the Bolsonaro, pro-Bolsonaro, pro-military, uh, demand the pro Bolsonaro movements. And so I think that more than ever, Brazil today is a mirror to the world. It, and to the two countries, like uh, we, well, when we, are, we, we could think that France and Brazil could be in the same place. But I think that uh, Brazil today shows um, how, what democratic disenchantment can produce. So you're saying the parallel with the Yellow Vest movement is the fact that it wasn't kind of led by one person in particular. There was a sort of sense of people with a, a mm. shared disgruntlement, a, a shared yeah. anger, getting together and then moving together. Anti-system anti uh, feeling, an anti-system against this. Because I was there and I, 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 the, the words I, I heard, you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you don't see them, you can do so. Uh, so. I'm in a, in, a, as, in a sanatorium 
or I'm in the in a revolutionary uh, camp, you know, because they, as as you said, they they think they are part of a a real revolution, a conservative revolution, and Lula is the enemy. Lula, he, he represents the communism, uh, the, the communist uh, threat, and the, and the, how the, the, the uh, how do I say, the the, the non-conservative values. So it's incarnated by one person and the other person were Bolsonaro. But I think that we have to begin to think Bolsonarism without Bolsonaro. He, Bolsonaro we, uh, 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 no, knew this. And I think that he will run off of Brazil. It's not by, by, by chance, by like uh, well, Somaza. He, he actually saw coming what is happening and yeah. what he should get he, out. I think it, it saw it coming. So you're saying that he he's, saw it he's not the person who's taking advantage of this. He's actually perhaps I, overtaken by it all. He, 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 were, he, he was a, a revolutionary, revolutionary leader. Mm. But you have to you know? this in perspective, For them. Though, I would say, that in 2013, the big uh, uh, riots was because the price of the transportation. Mm. 10 cents. 10 cents. And then yeah. everybody, 20, 20, 20 20 cents. Cents. everybody went to the streets. But then we had this huge scandal in the Gile Oil uh, Company, Petrobras. Uh, let's remember the, new, the numbers is 4.3 uh, 4 billion reais, which is 800 million euros or, or dollars, let's say, that were um, returned to the Brazil state during the seven years of investigations. So every political party was involved. It was not yeah. just Lula, just Lula. But this started this disenchantment about politics in Brazil. I wrote a book and I came here uh, to talk about this book. It was in, after 2013 and it was called Brazil the Reconstruction. I mean, uh, can we reconstruct our country after this big uh, Lava Jato scandal? And I was always uh, sure that the, the um, democratic institutions would be strong. And I hope I can continue thinking like that. OK, can I just stop you all and bring Tim Vickery back in? Tim, we've kind of come full circle to what you were saying about the, the conspiracy about these people feeling that they are revolutionaries who are somehow trying to save uh, Brazil from uh, Lula da Silva. Uh, also, we've heard reference to the car wash scandal. Can you give us a very brief explanation as to what that is, just to get everybody up to speed on that, please, Tim? Yeah, that was an anti-corruption inquiry. Now, corruption is a reality in Brazilian politics in two ways. Uh, number one, it's the way that historically business has always been done. Number two, politically it is necessary because Brazilian politics doesn't give the president a majority in Congress. You have to put together a big coalition of parties in order to govern. How on earth do you get them all together? It almost inevitably leads to corruption. And it was this anti-system aspect that helped Bolsonaro to power. He is, in a way, I think, a child of those 2013 demonstrations that started from the left about transport. Then they became linked to government spending on the Confederations Cup and the World Cup, um, which would take place the next year. And originally, as I say, they were from the left. What happened was that a slogan took hold of those uh, demonstrations, which is, my political party is Brazil. Now, you can't have a functioning democracy without political parties. Uh, and a, a current of, of, of opinions, of differing opinions, is necessary. And that slogan, my political party is Brazil, played right into the hands of Jair Bolsonaro, right in the hands of far-right nationalism. His supporters immediately latched on to the yellow shirt of Brazil's national football team as a symbol. In fact, today, Brazil's FA, the CBF, have distanced themselves, perhaps belatedly. They've distanced themselves from the far right. They've repudiated the political vandalism, uh, the, the attempt at a coup d'etat yesterday, and they've, uh, they've stressed that the yellow shirt belongs to everyone. But that's a huge part of the context that swept Bolsonaro to power. More fundamentally, I think there are ways in which we are still here fighting the battles of the 80s. Um, the Constitution of 1988 was always seen by some on the right as giving too many rights. The right to free health care, for example, uh, a system, a health system based on, on uh, the UK's National Health Service. 
There are people in the medical profession who've never really liked that. And the medical profession, despite everything that happened during the pandemic, there's still considerable support for the far right in the medical profession. But also the amnesty that was agreed with the armed forces in 1985 in order to bring democracy back. It means that Brazil has never really fully gone through the process of truth and reconciliation that we've seen in other countries in South America where there was a military dictatorship. And we've seen the importance of the military in the last few hours because the objective of what happened yesterday, the invasion of Congress, it was to try and encourage the military to take control. Brazil's young democracy is still dependent on a very, very powerful military. Tim, you've reassured me that I'm on the right track because I was about to turn to our guests and say, is the, the issue that we're seeing today to do with wounds from the past? Tim talking about lack of truth and reconciliation. It's necessary to heal the wounds of the past in order to build the future. Would you say, uh, Ligia Mora, that that is a, a case? Would you agree with Tim that basically the problems of the past haven't really been resolved? That's for sure. That's for sure. I do agree completely with Tim. This is exactly what we have to do. I mean, we thought that we have passed over, you know, the dictatorship regime, because actually if you compare the dictatorship regime in Brazil with other countries in South America, especially Chile and Argentina, our dictatorship regime was not that strong as it was in Chile and Argentina. So we thought that maybe it was not that bad. But yes, it was bad. We haven't healed well. And I think that we are seeing, you know, the results that we have actually to save that. Because the militaries, they are not going to save us. Not at all. Democracy is going to save us. Fighting corruption is going to save us. You know, not the military. The military are not going to save. And there is a word that's the amnesty. So there was this amnesty oh, yeah. exactly. in Brazil. No one was guilty of the crimes that occurred during the dictatorship. We interviewed today at uh, RFI uh, Juliette Dumont uh, from Sorbonne Nouvelle, and he was saying this, that the problem yes. is that this uh, feeling of... Uh, there is no, no guilt. guilty. No guilt. Yes. There is no guilt. And mm -hmm. also it was not as strong as in Chile and Argentina. So you don't have the mothers of the place of, uh, May, of May in, in Argentina, you know, as we had in Brazil. In Brazil, we didn't have that. So maybe we thought that it was not that bad, but it was bad. Actually, it was really bad. And military regime was also corrupt. People think, oh, they were not corrupt. No, they were corrupt as well. Only because as we were living during a dictatorship regime, we didn't know what was happening. So there was no transparency. But it does not mean that there was no corruption during the dictatorship regime, as those people, they want to say. And, and I run a research center on, on corruption. That's why I'm talking a, a lot about No, corruption. please do. Yes. And we appreciate and, what you're uh, saying. And, and so and people, they have this idea that, you know, during the military, we didn't have corruption. And that's why the military, they were so nice. No. And also the economic <laughs> miracle in exactly. the 70s. When I was exactly. born, there was this uh, economic uh, boom, boom in Brazil. Mm -hmm. and so everybody yeah. thinks it was better before. I used to have a car. I used to have mm -hmm. uh, exactly. houses. And uh, now I cannot buy but meat. it was a boom that then was destroyed. Yeah. And then there was Inflation. a huge recession. The economic. Several economic plans that did not succeed. It was only after democracy that we actually have been put in a better, better uh, path from an economic perspective. So Delphine Neto, one of the, the ministers of finance forever and ever during the military regime in Brazil, I, I would say that, you know, he, he didn't do a good job because during several years, Brazil was in a recession. And, uh, and so this is generation on generation of, of whoever's in charge failing whoever votes for them. Basically, each successive government hasn't really delivered for the people. Yeah, and the yes. foe is very, very strong when the disenchantment came and the pe people are, they, they realized that they were in, a, in an illusion of uh, ascending, social ascension. And uh, it then uh, the, the, the love became sight. And uh, we, we saw what we saw is a product of this begun in 2013, like you said, and finish uh, in 2018, but the process is ongoing. 
But what we are going to put instead of the Republic, uh, Democratic Republic of Brazil, I still don't understand what they are giving us uh, instead of the, the separation of the three powers, yeah. like here, like in France. But, but I mean, like, we, we, like we should be grateful for this yeah. democracy. We should be grateful mm. for the real, the plano real. You know, we fight, uh, we fight inflation. I think we should be thinking about growth about education, about how we are going to develop. Yeah. Yes, but, there are but so I think, many I think problems. Just, just to finish, I think that uh, this, uh, how, how do I say, this thought, this, uh, um, this will of changing things, this, uh, this, this an analysis of uh, the system, the, 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 the democracy in which we live in Brazil does not work. This is an idea that is not wrong. Even the Bolsonaro supporters know this. Even the far right and the far right, uh, how do I say, are very happy to, 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 to have this, this revolutionary uh, will. Uh, and I think that we, ha we can't just say, like I think that it was, was a mistake, say they are all fascists and terrorists. Well, Lula called them fascists, yeah. yeah. Because they, uh, there are people that are mad, there are people that are in the process of, uh, uh, how do I say, a collective process, then they don't know really why, what, uh, what, here, what they are doing there. And I think that it's very, uh, it, we are in a very delicate moment. So democratic, democratic as an idea is uh, in, at stake. So uh, if we, uh, uh, how do I say, uh, profoundly uh, uh, go with this, this idea of polarization, it will become even worse. You know, though, so Lula was elected to, to change that. But I think that he, as a person, as a figure, can do that alone because he represents for these people in this very solid an enemy, not a, 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 some, a political adversary, he, an enemy. And then to, to be, and these people are ready to die for it. And you've met them. You've been in the camp. Yeah. You've, seen, you've looked in their eyes. You yeah. know this. Yeah. This, the is anger. Not you just, this is not you making it up. You've actually been face to face with these people. I saw hate. I didn't saw hate in my life. I saw hate. Saw it there. Philip, thank you. Let's go back to Tim Vickery. Tim, we talked, you ended talking about truth and reconciliation. Uh, we've established from our, our panel that that is a long, long way off, isn't it? Um, can I ask about the, the trial process that Lula's promising? Because obviously he said that the, the fascists, to use his words, uh, will be made to pay for what they've done. Um, again, it, it's, is, this, is, is this something perhaps that's just going to polarise Brazil even more, the kind of hounding down and chasing of people, that, that process? It's, it's, it is, though, an inevitable process, isn't it? Yes, and I'm not seeing at the moment polarisation. I'm seeing marginalisation of the far right. Uh, many of the centre right, the traditional right, are absolutely appalled by what they saw yesterday and scenes of just wanton vandalism to public property, to, to, to great works of art, and also that scene that really sticks out. The mob attacking a policeman on a horse with iron bars and sticks and, and, and unseating him from his horse. And that for, for the conventional right who favour law and order, that really isn't a good image. So at the moment, I'm seeing a marginalisation and I think a majority of society would like these people to be confronted with, with due process. I'm fascinated uh, by what Philippe's just told us about the hate that he saw in, in, in people's eyes and, and uh, people willing to die. I don't uh, dispute his conclusion at all. The question I ask is, what are they dying for? What are they prepared to die for? Because in my experience, if you ask these people, what do you really want? What do you want? Now, once you let's say you've got rid of Lula, you've brought in military. What do you want? I have never received a concrete answer. And the, 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 the Bolsonaro slogan, the, the, the God uh, uh, country family, it's just so vague. What does it mean? What does God mean? Even within one religion, there are hundreds of different interpretations. What does, what does country mean? 
when Bolsonaro's nationalism seemed to be following the foreign policy of Donald Trump's United States rather than the interests of Brazil. It all seems so vague. They're prepared to die, but what really do they want and what are they prepared to die for? I still don't know. Tim Vickery in Rio, thank you very much indeed. Thanks to our panel here in the studio. They are Maria Paula Cavallo of Radio France International, great to see you. Over the other side of us, Legio Maro Costa, professor at the FGV, which is the Getulio Vargas Foundation. Thank you for your insight. And thanks to our filmmaker, Philippe Galvo. Thanks for your insight, sir. He met the protesters and saw them eye to eye. Thanks for watching. Stay with us. You're watching France 24.